scripture reading today comes from Luke 6, uh, verses 27 to 31. <clears throat> but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Bless those, or pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me for prayer? Father, I ask you to guide my words and guide our hearts to a better understanding of what you desire for our lives. It is in your name. Amen. So at the end of June, my grandmother turned 90. And we all flew uh, and drove into Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she's living and where I'm from, uh, to celebrate her birthday. And there was a lot of people there, and there, uh, it had been about a decade since we'd all gotten together as a large family, so some of the old stories were told uh, kind of to the new generation. My uncle decided to tell the story of the snowball fight, and I'm in this story, and so I was going to tell it to you guys. It was Christmas in Tulsa, and uh, it was rare to, to get snow over the Christmas holiday, uh, but we had, and we got a lot of snow. It was a cold winter, uh, and um, there's about a foot of snow. It was so much that we could make snow forts. I know you guys are from South Texas, so let me just explain this to you. You can take snow and stuff it into a bucket and then turn it over, and then you can stack up those like little snow bricks, and that makes a little fort. I know you guys from San Antonio, it, that's real. You can really do that, just so you know. And so these were the uh, houses for numerous snowball fights for that week. Uh, and one in particular, the last one, ended dramatically. It was me and my cousin versus my uncle. I was uh, about 10 uh, and my uncle was 30. I don't know why that's important, but it just seems important. Um, and so we were throwing just back and forth, just a regular snowball fight, nothing big was happening. And then something happened. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was the humidity, the curvature, the earth, the gravitational constant, I don't know. But he stuck his head out right as I let one fly, and it was perfect. I play it back in slow motion, head. I tattooed him right on the nose. It was amazing. It was a great shot. It was the mid-80s, and he was wearing Maverick-style aviator sunglasses, and they were all black, and then all of a sudden they were all white. It was awesome. It was so good. I still, it, it's still, mm. okay. So anyway, I celebrated. But his reaction was not what I expected. I expected him to just proclaim my victory of all snowball fights ever, and he didn't do that. He, in fact, left his snow fort, walked through our snow fort, grabbed me, threw me into the snow, proceeded to tickle me and throw snow inside my jacket repeatedly. Yes. Now, we have been playing for a while. It was cold. I was wet. And I was being tickled. And I realized something. I had to go pee. <laughs> I told my uncle this repeatedly. I just, want to, I just want to stress that. Repeatedly I told him, I had to go, but he proceeded to tickle me, and I proceeded to go. <laughs> yes, and so fun, joyous victory turned into embarrassment and, and shame and anger. So I did what any 10-year-old would do. I told on him. That's right. Went inside the house announced to the entire family that Uncle Mark would not let me go to the restroom and held me down in the snow until I soiled myself. And that divided the family into lines. 
Some supported me, thinking that Uncle Mark was in the wrong. Some were obviously supporting him because they were just laughing. Um, and I always think, like, what happened that turned a joyous, awesome snowball fight into something that divided a family and is still being talked about 30 years later? It's, it's actually the thing that Jesus was talking about in our scriptures today. Because my uncle sought revenge for a perfectly timed snowball throw, and I sought revenge for being tickled in the snow and an accident that happened thereof. Now, Jesus is talking about this in our scripture. He's talking against the concept of reciprocity. Now, reciprocity seems, seems good. It seems fair. It seems just. The Old Testament laws, uh, ones that Jesus specifically mentions in, in the other gospel as compared to this talk, talks about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, these come from the Old Testament, but they go back even farther than that. In the 18th century B.C., one of the first laws that we have the historical record of is called the Code of Hammurabi, and it literally says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It was revolutionary at the time, because at, this was the first time that a common person, a common man, could seek restitution if they were denied something or something was taken away from them. And it, it seems fair. It seems natural, even progressive, uh, the idea that we have laws that, and, and modes in our life that take and give to people if, if things have been taken or given to them. Under, under those constructs, if you are a good person, then good things happen to you. And if you're a person who hurts people or steals from people, then you're hurt or things are taken from you. It, it seems like it works. So why would Jesus speak out against it? Why would he say, no, don't do this, do something else? That's because I believe that Jesus knows us and knows how we actually live into these things. Because the idea of reciprocity, the idea of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, it's like the El Camino. It looks great on paper, and then you see it in real life. You're like, oh man, that's not that cool. Because Jesus knows us, and the natural outcome of anything that has to do with reciprocity is one of two avenues. One, the idea of escalation. I do something to my uncle, my uncle does something a little bit worse back to me, and then I do something a little bit worse back to my uncle. It's how friends and acquaintances become enemies and people we don't trust. The other is, is similar to it, but it's the idea of premeditation. That's do unto others as they do unto you turns into do unto others before they do unto you. And then it's a small step to do unto others because they could do unto you. And then you just drop the, the qualifier and say, do unto others. And I believe that Jesus knows that these are the natural ways that we would live in to the idea of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, or love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's where that goes. And Jesus speaks out over and against it and transcends the idea of justice and fairness with the idea of love and mercy and forgiveness. All right, so here's what I'm not going to do today. I'm not going to apply this for you guys today. There's no prescriptions today at all. I can tell you a little bit about culture as far as the scriptures. I can tell you about a little bit of interpretation. I can tell you about how I apply this in my life. But what I can't do for you is apply it to yours. The reason is, is because people disagree on how this applies across the board. And so what I'm not going to do is tell you how you should live in this scripture. And I, what I definitely don't want to see happen is you emailing somebody and saying, hey, Patrick gave this sermon, and between his sermon and my thoughts, we think that you should do this thing. Okay? Now that will get me in trouble, and I don't want to do that. Okay? So just do me a favor and understand that I'm not going to apply this to your life today, but I'm going to ask that you do it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Because these are hard things. Even biblical scholars 
don't agree on what Jesus is saying here. Not at all. Now, some believe that Jesus is speaking in hyperbole or, or using hyperbole. So he's saying a big ideologized statement and then supporting that statement with exaggerations, things that he doesn't think we really do, but just kind of prove his point. Others believe the exact opposite. St. Augustine, as a notable example, has said this. He says, the fewer exceptions you can make to what Jesus is saying in this scripture, the easier it is to apply in your life. Now, some people believe that Jesus is speaking in a cultural specific model, a, a political model that was happening to him at the time he said it. You see, the, the Jewish people, the Israelites, had laws that said eye for an eye and tooth for a truth. We think they were, they were patterned after the Code of Hammurabi. But the Romans, who had conquered and defeated them and were occupying their land, had laws of subjugation. These laws said that a Roman citizen could demand things of those they had conquered. Things like, hey, if I need you to carry my stuff, I can make you carry a mile. If you have a coat on and I'm cold, I can demand and you have to give me your coat so that I can wear it for a certain length of time. So people believe that Jesus was speaking specifically about that culture and that political framework that they were in then. Others believe that Jesus was doing a logical progressive argument. And that is that Jesus said something, a big ideological statement, followed it with the emotional, and then the material, and finally the practical, which is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, contrasted to do unto others as they do unto you. Now what I think all the biblical scholars agree upon is that Jesus does not list out six things and says just do these six and you're good. Now we need to uh, understand that Jesus is talking about an ideological and a philosophy of action for us. And moreover, he's talking about something that's hard. Now the word he uses here for love is agape. Some biblical scholars believe that when they use the word agape, and some authors, when they use the word agape, they mean a universal love, a love for all mankind. But there are some things that Jesus definitely is not saying here. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Jesus is not telling you that you have to like everybody. Jesus is not telling us that we have to enjoy or get warm, fuzzy feelings if someone hits us or steals from us or takes from us or is mean to us or is disrespectful to us. Jesus is not saying that we have to enjoy that. He's not saying that we seek out victimhood either. He's not, he's not talking about timidity. He's not talking about weakness. It's actually because these things are really hard to do. And he's definitely not talking about victimhood. He's, not, he's speaking about being others-focused, of letting you as a person set the agenda. Now follow me through this, because this gets kind of challenging. If you're a, 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 a person, if we practice reciprocity, the idea that we're going to get even or restore our honor or our self-respect, what we're actually doing is we're giving power to somebody else. If we let them determine how we will respond to them, then we're giving them both the initiative and the ability to manipulate us. I was talking to Abel this week, and he said this to me as we were talking about this topic because I was telling him that I was struggling particularly on what to talk about and he said this, this is an amazing line. So if you don't take anything away, just remember this. And it's from Abel. Just so you know, Abel. Abel. All Abel. And that's this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. You, I quoted it from somebody else who quoted it from someone else who heard it from, like, Jesus' like, best friend. Right? Okay, anyway. So he says this. He says, if you fail to forgive someone, it's like giving them free rent in your heart and mind. I really like that because I don't like the idea of free rent for anybody. But contrasted to that, if you're a person who walks into any situation with the intentional, premeditated thought of I'm going to be loving and forgiving to everybody in the situation, what you've actually done is broken the chains 
of reciprocity. Because now, no one else can control or manipulate your actions. You get to live in those things as you desire, as you want to. Now, it sounds wonderful, the idea of freedom in what you're doing, but let me tell you, it's hard. It's really, really difficult to do those things. And living into it is not easy. Jesus gives us multiple examples of it. He talks about when Peter asked, hey, how many times should I forgive my brother? And, P and Jesus answers 70 times 7. It was in, in the song that Abel sang, 70 times 7. If you're doing math in your head right now, you're missing it. Paul talks about in the, the most famous wedding verse that love keeps no record of wrongs. It's not just for married couples, it's for everybody. That actual loving folks means you don't keep a record of wrongs. You're not letting other people off the hook in that. You're letting yourself off the hook. You're putting down the, the, the bricks of keeping the ideas of fairness in your life and justice in your life and transcending it with the idea of love, mercy, and forgiveness. Now, Jesus is saying a lot of things, but he's not saying that you should fail to protect yourself. Some of the ways I choose to, to make sure I, I live into this is that I'm not letting my kids sleep behind my doors unlocked. I'm not giving anybody my social security number, so don't ask. And I'm not going to leave my keys in my car at like 7-Eleven unlocked. That's, that's not turning the other cheek. That's not giving to people freely. No, that's failing to be a good steward of the things that Jesus has provided us. So how you live into this is for you to determine. How you live into it is tough. Jesus doesn't ask us to do something easy here. He's asking us to do something really, really, really hard. So difficult that I'm even scared to apply it to you guys because how you apply it is your own. But at the same time, I believe as you're doing it, the amount of freedom, independence, and the amount of control over your own life goes up rather than goes down. The pastor of the largest church in the world is named is David Young Yi Cho. He's a pastor of a church of a million people. It's in Seoul, Korea. It's so big that they ask their people to not show up on Sunday. Let me say that again. They ask their people to not show up because they can't fit them all in the building. It's the only church I've ever heard of that does that. And David Young Yi Cho is a brilliant guy. But if you ask him how this church grew in one generation from a handful of people, because it started as a house church, to a million people, David Young Cho will answer you with the simple word, prayer. And he is known as the prayer warrior's prayer warrior. He's known as the guy that gets up four hours before anybody else in his household and spends four hours in solitude and prayer. Now, one day, a, an interview, uh, what's that guy, like a journalist, interview guy, that's a good word, a journalist was coming to interview him, uh, specifically for a Christian magazine, about his prayer life. And the guy was asking, him, like, okay, so what's your mode of prayer? How do you do it? Uh, what's your mindset? Uh, all those things that logistical, and then also like the, his framework. And David uh, Young Cho is a pretty, pretty smart guy and recognized the pattern in the questions. And finally, he just stopped the interview and says, hold on, I just want to make something really clear here. Are, are you saying or suggesting that I spend all this time in prayer because I'm holy? And the journalist responds like, yeah, like you're amazing, you're so pious, and you're so disciplined, and the Lord is obviously blessing you and your church because of your discipline and prayers. And David's like, no, you're totally missing it. It's just the exact opposite. He says, I don't pray because I'm good, I don't pray because I'm righteous, I pray because I'm not. And then he goes on to tell a story that he has 300 junior associate pastors who work for him, who help him lead and manage the church. 
And he says, I can't stand any of them. I just don't like them at all. He's like, they're, they're sh- long-winded and short-sighted. He says, they're, they're selfish, they're combative, they're manipulative. They complain about the church. They complain about each other. They complain about me. All the things that just, they make my days so much more difficult than they have to be. I can't stand them. Now, I don't speak very much Korean, which is to say I don't speak any Korean. Um, but I've heard that he even used the word like hate. I hate them. He says, that's why I pray. That's why I spend time in prayer. It's not because I'm holy. It's because I'm righteous. I mean, it's not because I'm righteous and holy. It's because I'm evil. I pray so that I can forgive them because of all their faults. And I pray that the Lord would forgive me and that they would forgive me when I act just like them. And that's the, the mode, I think, that, that Jesus is, is proclaiming to us. That we seek him out in prayer for the power and the ability to do these, this thing that is so difficult, so challenging, but at the same time, it's super, super sweet. Now, I wasn't going to tell this story, but I have a little extra time, so I'm going to tell it anyway. It was, a, it was a hot afternoon, like it would be later on today, and I had the kids strapped into the back of the car, and we're driving on a two-lane road, um, and it was so hot that we decided to stop and get some milkshakes. And I was just driving along, kind of vegging out, and I hear the conversation in the back, and my kids are talking about spitting. And so I look in the rearview mirror, and my daughter, who's catty cornered to me, is like getting ready to spit. And so I look back, and I'm like, no, Amelia, don't spit in the car. And then I turn forward, and I realize that the car in front of me has stopped. So I slam on the brakes. Now, I'm strapped in, the kids are strapped in, the milkshakes are not. So now I see three different flavors of milkshake from Sonic, delicious, um, on the windshield, the dashboard, the glove box, and the carpet. And I think to myself, no matter what happens, I'm never going to get that clean. My car is going to smell like sour milk until I sell it. I have to sell the car now. That's it. And so then I turn around to my kids, and I can't even tell you what, what, I said, because I don't remember, I think I blocked it out. But let's just say that it was not pretty, it was not friendly, it was not nice. It has nothing to do with what Jesus was just talking about in our scripture today. So I get home, and I set them on the couch, and they're wide-eyed as can be. And I go out, and I grab all cleaning products, and I'm cleaning my car. It takes me less than 15 minutes to clean my car. And so I go in, and they're still on the couch. They're so shocked that they haven't moved. And I realize all the things, all the things that I just said to them are things that I promised myself I would never say to my children, especially about possibly not even spitting in the car, just pretending to spit in the car, and about milkshakes, which cost less than $4. And so I sat between them, and I tell them I'm sorry that they didn't do anything wrong, it was all my fault, it was just an accident. And then my son and my daughter both hug me from both sides and say, it's okay, Dad. We all make mistakes. Those guys, there's something about being a pastor who speaks about forgiveness and still learning about forgiveness from my, at the time, four- and six-year-old kids. And so today, I'll tell you, what Jesus promised us is very hard, but at the same time, if you achieve it or if you're trying to achieve it, there's some sweetness there. Why don't you bow with me for prayer?